Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, uh, today, long anticipated day for many of you guys, but I am starting to get my steam stoker engine back out and trying to get ready to kind of put this project back in the forefront. It's been on the back burner now for a while for a couple of different reasons, and I've talked about this a little bit in the past, but in case you've missed it, uh, just kind of let you know what has been going on. So. First and foremost, I have decided, number one, that my priority in the shop has been to get my metal planer finished. And that is still my top priority. Before I really get started on another project full time, this will be the next project that I really focus on, if you can call it focusing. I get so many little sidetrack jobs that come in here, it's hard for me to stay really focused on a project, uh, as you probably see by the variety of things that I post on my channel. But regardless, I wanna get the, the planer finished. I'm real close in there, and we still got a few things to wrap up on it, but kinda next in queue is the, metal st the, or the, the steam stoker engine. The steam stoker engine goes on a steam locomotive. It is used for, uh, as a power source, power and auger that moves the coal from the tender of the locomotive up into the firebox of the locomotive. Basically, this replaced the fireman and the shovel. There's still a fireman, but instead of having to manually shovel the coal, they use this steam engine here to do the back breaking work for them. As locomotives got larger and larger, the ability for a person to keep up with the coal demand on these locomotives became very challenging. So they came up with these steam stokers to help um, mechanically put the coal into the boiler. This steam stoker is destined to go on a steam locomotive restoration of Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville Steam is in the process of restoring a uh, locomotive. We've talked about this in the past and this is part of that project. Uh, that project is ongoing. It is a long-term project. They've got a long way to go. So this has not been a super rush job by any means, um, honestly they're still several years away from having that locomotive ready to go. So we've got plenty of time and I've known that all along, which is why, part of the reason why it's kind of been on the back burner. Now, uh, previously, we've taken this thing apart. I've got a bunch of the smaller parts already made, either done by myself or done with some collaboration with some other YouTubers. And what's really been holding me up for the last little while is two different jobs that I had sent out to other shops to help me out with. One of them had to do with this case here. This is the main body. And we'll show you this here in a minute, but down the bottom of this, there's a couple of uh, journals as our slide pieces where a crosshead goes back and forth. There was significant wear and pitting in the bottom of those. Uh, I went in and we used a spray welding process to build that up, needing to machine it back down. On this, my plan was for uh, Adam Booth, my good buddy A-Bomb79, uh, was gonna help me out and do this on his metal uh, shaper. Uh, once he got the, this set up on his metal shaper, it became evident that there just was not enough clearance inside of this to properly machine this out. And yes, I know there was a lot of people that had uh, input and suggestions on how they might be able to finagle the cutter head to do it. Trust me guys, we checked this thing inside out. It just wasn't gonna be possible to do it that way. And originally, it's very evident in here that this was done on a milling machine when it was done originally. You can see, you'll still see the circular uh, cut marks down in this uh, part. Some of that stuff we've covered up, but trust me, you can see the milling marks still in this thing. So um, that's kind of plan B, is we're gonna do it with a milling machine. And I've got a cutter that we modified so that we can do that with. We're gonna be doing that coming up. Um, and today's video is kind of getting a little bit prepped for that. And also the other thing that's kind of been holding me up on this project is as I sent the crankshaft out on this, uh, this is a two cylinder steam engine. And unlike a lot of steam engines, it has a crankshaft very similar to like you would see in an, in an uh, automotive type engine, a gasoline or diesel engine. And the crankshaft had some significant wear on it. I have that crankshaft down in a shop not far from me that specializes in doing crankshaft work. They are basically having to build up all the journals on there, uh, weld those up, and uh, we've got a shop that that's what they specialize in doing. He's got special equipment machinery to build up journals on crankshafts and then grind them back down. 
And honestly, I've been waiting to get this piece back into my shop because I needed to get some verification on some measurements before he could really proceed with that grinding job. So uh, today what we're going to do is I'm going to show you what we're going to do as far as machining these out. We're also going to do some inspection work on here to check these uh, bearings in here to see where we need to go to on that crankshaft to make sure that we get the crankshaft ground to a size that's going to be appropriate to use here. So let's zoom in here and kind of show you what we got going. We're looking kind of down into this uh, case now. And uh, again, this is a little bit of an unusual steam engine. Two cylinders uh, offsetting. These are quartered just like on a steam locomotive. Uh, you got a crankshaft that runs in here. This is the main bearing. There's some outboard bearings on either side that kind of bolt to the side of this. It has a bronze uh, bearing on the inside of that. And uh, we need to do some measurements on that to kind of see what sizes these bronzes are so that again, we can machine our crankshaft, uh, make sure that we're not making it too small is really my biggest concern. Uh, down here in the bottom, you see these little troughs. Uh, there's a cross head, a piece that goes back and forth in here. So you got the crankshaft with a with a connecting rod that comes down here, you got a rocking action going on. The purpose of the cross head is that it slides back and forth and you get the rocking action on one side, but it converts it into a linear motion that goes up through the front of this. The cylinders are on the front. I don't have those mounted right now where the piston rod is at. So we're converting that up and down motion that you get with a, a, a piston going off of a crankshaft into a linear motion using that crosshead mechanism. Now these, this, uh, this uh, Stoker engine had set, it'd been taken out of service many years ago. It set out literally uh, outdoors for many, many years. And what happened is down at the bottom of this, we had a, some severe pitting and it was not a suitable surface for that thing to slide back and forth on. To get, out, to get around this, we used a spray welding technique where we heated the metal up and sprayed on a powder to build this back up. This is a cast iron type material. We talked with the, uh, the spray welding people to come up with the right product, uh, right powder to use on this job. And um, I'm fairly confident that we got a good, um, good layer in here, but we need to come in here and machine this. And you can see right here, that's where Adam had tried to do this on his metal shaper. He was able to get into the middle part, but he wasn't going to be able to get up to the corners. Again, you can go check out his video and see the challenges that he had doing this. He really put forth his best effort to try to help us out on this, but it just was not the right machine for this particular job. So what is our game plan on remachining these? Uh, we're going to use a milling cutter. Now, if you look, you can very clearly see on the tops of this, that circular pattern where they had a milling cutter that went in here and decked that off. You can't see it now because we built it up, but you could actually still see in the bottom where they had a similar circular pattern going in here where they had milled that out originally at the factory. So they were using some type of milling cutter to drop down in here and do that. And that's exactly what we're going to do to try to, to, to machine this thing out. Now, I don't know their original setup. This really has a lot of challenges. The biggest challenge that we've got with any kind of machining process is that you've got this piece right here in the front. And if you look straight down from here, from, <coughs> from this face, to the back of this is probably less than an inch clearance right there. Now, if you notice, they kind of undercut this, so you got a little pocket behind it, and that was to give room, or at least I hypothesize, that was to give root clearance for that cutter uh, to get behind that. And to do this, uh, what I'm going to do is, is, if you watch my channel, we made this extended arbor for a shell mill. The shell mill is basically like a big milling cutter and it will be able to drop down in here and this is going to be able to go back in there. We actually got clearance. It can go all the way back to this shaft, really almost hits uh, this front piece here to get in here and mill this thing out. Now, when I did this cutter, I had a lot of people say this is never going to work, uh, that I'm, I'm crazy for even trying because it's too long, there's going to be too much flex et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I can't argue with you. When I did the video, I said, I'm concerned about exactly that. 
but I really just don't see any other way to get around it. And the other side of the coin is, is that it's very evident that they basically use a very similar setup to this to do this. And because of the, the, the size here and the, you know, from this edge back to here, you really can only have a little bit over an inch on that shaft to be able to get the clearance that you need to do there. No matter what size cutter you put down here, th your, this shaft here is really limited to about an inch and probably a quarter uh, maximum diameter to be able to get the clearance in there. And that's more or less what we got. It's, I think this is, uh, I can't remember the exact size, but I, I basically went with the largest size diameter that I felt I could get away with. Uh, and that's going to be my game plan, and it's going to be a tough job. I know it's going to be a tough job. Uh, we're probably going to have some chatter and some issues. We're just going to have to get in there, take our time, make light cuts, and uh, get it just uh, get it cut out. That's all we can do. Uh, and I'm confident it's going to work, guys, uh, but I also am pretty confident it's going to be challenging, but we're going to get it done. A couple other comments that are just kind of in response to comments I've had in the past. Uh, my game plan is that I'm going to go down to uh, Florida to my friend John Terry's shop. John has a big, really a very large uh, Cincinnati horizontal milling machine that has a vertical head built into it. And we're going to basically set this Stoker engine down on the mill table. I'm going to have to fabricate some type of plate for this to sit down because this is actually wider than the table. We got plenty of clearance on this big machine, but I'm going to have to make a plate for this thing to sit on, uh, get it all trammed in and leveled out and shimmed out, whatever we needed to get it positioned just right. And we use that vertical head to come down and actually do the milling on this. Now, quite a few people have commented, why don't I do this on a horizontal boring mill or on my horizontal boring mill? And uh, while I do have a horizontal boring mill in the shop, number one, my horizontal boring mill is not ready to do a job like this. Uh, it's needing some work done to it really before I can start using it. Uh, and even if it was running right now, I haven't used that machine enough yet to really be confident to do a critical job like this on. And even more importantly than that, if I did do this on the horizontal boring mill, I would basically have to mount this whole Stoker engine on an angle plate, which I've got an angle plate big enough to mount it to. That's not the issue, but it would basically be sitting going up and down, basically turn 90 degrees up. And then we would have the cutter coming straight in like this right here, going up and down and milling it. While, yeah, it can be done that way, I'm just concerned with this weight and this size having to get it sitting at 90 degrees where gravity is constantly working against you. When I had the option that I can do it on a vertical machine where I can set this case straight down on the table and I have gravity working in my favor. Gravity's gonna be pulling this thing straight down that table. We're still gonna clamp it down obviously and get it very nice and rigid. But in a vertical setup, you're not worried about, is my part moving around? I don't have to worry about having a crane to basically get this thing set up and bumping it around. Could it be done on that horizontal boring mill? Absolutely. Uh, but I really feel like that the vertical mill in this case is gonna be a better option. And because I have access to one that is large enough, we're not talking about a bridge port here, guys. This, this uh, mill that we're gonna be using it is, is probably 15, 20,000 pound machine with a really large table on it. And uh, that, that is my game plan. I really feel like that's gonna be better than using a horizontal boring mill uh, for this particular application. So again, just kind of responding to some comments people have made. And uh, while they're good comments and they're valid comments, and that's definitely a way that we could go about doing it. Uh, and you know, if I had that horizontal bo boring mill set up and running in my shop, I'd probably give a little more serious consideration because I could do it right here. But again, that's not even an option right now. Even if I were to do it on a horizontal board mill, I'd probably have to haul it up to my friend Brian Block's shop up in Kentucky, which is about three times the distance as my, the shop down in Florida. Uh, and even then, you know, again, we've got the, the problems. You've got to mount it on, a, on an angle plate now. You've got to do all this other setup where using the vertical mill is just going to, I think, be a better option. 
So the next thing that I really want to look at here is I want to do some inspection work on these bearings that the crankshaft goes on. Now I mentioned that I have already taken the crankshaft to a shop that specializes in crankshaft uh, repair and working on crankshafts, regrinding crankshafts. And I'm confident that I got a really good guy that's going to do me a great job on that. I took him the original blueprints for the crankshaft and uh, we went back and forth and he says, well, you know, I can easily take this back to original specs. But he says, you probably want to measure your bearings to see if we don't need to make some compensation to the crankshaft to match the bearings. So in other words, you know, these bearings were originally, you know, they were three inches. That's what they were made at. Has the bearings worn oversize? And if so, do we need to make the uh, bearing or make the journals on the crankshaft a little bit larger so that we can get everything back, uh, make it run properly without having to make all new bronze bearings to go in here? Um, so valid question, one that I really had not taken into consideration when I took it over there to him. So um, I've been needing to check this. So I'm going to check this inside bearing here. Now this one is just, this guy's got a cap on it. I'm using a um, inside bore micrometer. This is a three pronged micrometer. Uh, when you turn this, it moves these uh, legs in inside, in and out. It's really nice because it's measuring in three points, which is extremely stable, where we get you right in the center of a bore. And it works just like a micrometer. And this thing is accurate uh, to two ten thousandths. And I have checked the calibration on it in a, uh, in a standard to make sure that we're reading good. So we're gonna put this up in here and clamp it down here and look at it and it looks like let's see that is 23 thousandths under three inches um i'm wondering if there may not have been some shims that were in these when i took that apart let me i'm gonna go back here and see if i can find some shims because that is actually about well, it's 23,000 smaller than what it should be. So that's telling me that either there were some shims in here to make it a little bit larger in this diameter, or the crankshaft had worn down and they replaced the bronze bearings in this thing with smaller ones to make it work rather than regrinding and building up the crankshaft. I don't know which. Uh, so let me, let me make sure there's not some... Uh, some uh, shims back there before I, I go any further. Okay, so I dug around and look what I found, a shim that had to have come out of this. Now I'm gonna have to go back and look at my video where I took this thing apart and uh, see how this goes in. There's only one shim though, which is kind of interesting. I would have figured they would have been two, but this shim is 50 thousandths of an inch thick and we're roughly 25 thousandths uh, smaller in diameter now, but it kind of makes sense that if I put a 50 thousandths under one side and none under the other, that's going to make this thing measure about three inches. So bottom line, guys, um, I'm pretty confident. I'm, I'm going to spend some more time on this probably off camera. And like I said, I want to go back and look at my original video and make sure that I'm not making a poor assumption here. But I think we're going to be pretty close to that three inch diameter. So according to my book that I've got, it shows three inches is the drawing dimension, the limit of where it could go up to three and three sixty fourths of an inch. And the tolerance on it is one sixty fourths of an inch. So basically that's telling me that I could be as, up to a sixty fourth of an inch um, within that, that, that measurement and still be within tolerance. So I'm pretty sure that we probably would just want to take this back to three inches. But like I said, I'm going to do some more checking on that before we make that call. Um, at the very least, because of the way, the way this is, I could shim this up a little bit on the undersize and uh, line bore this thing to exactly three inches and have a really nice finish in there, which may be what I end up doing. Let's check the outboard bearings. There's one that goes on either side of this. They bolt onto the side. Let me go check those. So these are the little end caps that bolt onto the either end of the, um, of the stoker. 
These have a solid bronze bushing in these. These are not split like the other ones. They actually slide up on the end of the crankshaft so you don't have to separate them to get them in there. So these will be a lot easier and a lot more accurate to measure. Again, I'll take my, my bore micrometer here. And let's see, where's the, okay, I can read it right there. Just getting this little thing where I can read it in here. And I'm gonna flip this up. And it looks like it is about two ten thousandths of an inch under three inches. So very close to the three inch original size. Again, that's, that's really good. That tells me that we don't have a lot of wear on that bearing. Let's check this other one out and see what it is. Come in here. I'm gonna probably get some more measurements just to make sure I, I'm measuring it in more than one place, but this will give me a, a rough indication. So, oops, let me do that again. Sorry, that was about two tenths oversized. This one is about two thousandths undersized. So it's actually just a little bit under three inches. Let me measure that in another spot here. Okay, that one's measuring just about maybe a couple of tenths under. Get out on this side. And that one's about a thou undersize. All right, that is actually really good news because if anything, these are right on size. And that tells me that I can have my crankshaft guy take this to a perfect three inches. And probably what I will do is um, put all the bearings on the machine and uh, very, very lightly line bore this thing and just take a thou or two out to give me some clearance in there. Again, we have a tolerance of a 64th of an inch, so I can, you know, it can actually be up to 15 thousandths or 14 thousandths, what is it? Uh, yeah, 15, 15 point six thousandths of an inch oversized and still be within tolerance. So uh, that's good news. Um, we're we're going to be in good shape. We're going to take these journal sizes on the crank on all three of them back to, to three inches, which was factory spec. Well, there we go. I basically got done what I wanted to get done here. And this is really about all I can do right now. The next big step is going to be to go down to Florida and uh, do my milling in here and get this thing ready. I can also go ahead and get back up with my crankshaft guy and let him know, yes, I want to get those journals ground back to the factory specs. Uh, and I think we're going to be fine. Like I said, we may have to open them up just a little bit to make everything fit right, but I can always take material out it's harder to add that material back on there. So we're, we're going to be in good shape in that department. Um, one comment, I know, I know someone's going to comment on this. They're going to see this right here. Uh, if you look, you see a little line across there. And I know because just looking at it, it looks like there's a crack right there. Guys, that is not a crack. All that is is a, a, a line in the casting itself where the sand had looks like a little fold in it or something. I don't know what happened, but that is completely solid. Trust me, it's not a crack. It's the, sh the way the light's hitting it in the shadow on just a, a, an imperfection on that casting. Um, if you were to hit that with a grinder and clean it up, it would totally disappear. But uh, again, I know someone's going to see that in comments, so I'm just trying to be preemptive here, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, that is going to be a wrap, guys. Uh, uh, hope, hope you're glad to see the Stoker back in the light of day. Um, I'm really hoping that once I get my metal planer all wrapped up, that this summer I can really focus on this project and get this thing back going. There's going to be a lot of work uh, on this Stoker engine still left to do. 
but I really need to be able to just kind of focus on it and get it done. And that's kind of been my game plan the whole time. Now that I've got this back into my shop where I can kind of work on it, um, I think we're good to go there. I think we're going to be able to hopefully get this thing back in gear and headed in that direction. Next big step for me is to get this engine down to Florida, uh, down at my friend John Terry's shop to do the milling part. Um, got a little bit of prep work before I can do that. Like I said, I got to get a plate to mount this thing on. Adam had done something very similar. I want to do a kind of a plate to mount this thing on so that we can get it set up properly on his machine. Uh, and then I can schedule that trip down to Florida. I want to get that done sooner than later because summertime is really, it's, it's here. Uh, and it's about to be really, really hot down there in Florida on, near the coast. And it's going to be 100 degrees and 90, 100% humidity. It's going to be miserable out there working in the shop if I don't hurry up and get down there and do this. So uh, I'm going to try to do that as soon as I can find a couple of days I can take off work and go down there and get it done or maybe do it over a long weekend or something. But there we go. That's where we're at. I uh, just thought you guys would enjoy getting caught up on this and uh, see that this project is coming back to the light of day. And with that, guys, that will be a wrap. As always, thanks for watching. Uh, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, thumbs up are appreciated. Comments are appreciated. And hit that bell icon so that you get notifications of new videos coming out. And with that, We'll catch you on the next video. As always, thanks for watching.